Welcome to this, the final episode of Fort Collins Before. In this episode, we're going to look at some of the changes that took place during the first part of the 1900s. One of the changes that took place is this place grew up. This is the Oval at Colorado State University. Another one of these changes is technological. That means that there are stoplights and street lights, plumbing and the telephone that all come to Fort Collins for the first time. So let's join Ron and Trelore as they talk about some of these changes of the early 1900s. By 1880, the town of Fort Collins was in a position where it was ready, really ready to just take off in terms of growth. Uh, as we've talked about, the town had reached a population of about 1,300 people by that time, and that was just in 13 years of growth. It had already gone from practically nothing to over 1,300 people. And it had gone through its, its infancy years, the time when it's like a little baby or so, uh, and was ready to just take off in terms of growing. The streets had been laid out, the first homes were built, the first commercial buildings had been put in that were housing stores and offices, and um, new people were moving in all the time. Also, the university, which was then known as the Colorado Agricultural College, had been started on the south end of town as well, and there were new buildings going in there all the time because the new students were arriving to take classes there. So, so what did Fort Collins need then with all of these new people coming in and new businesses and the agricultural college? Did the town need more things? Sure, there are all sorts of things that any town needs to turn from a town into a city. Uh, all kinds of things that today we just take for granted but at that time nobody had in place. Um, for example, uh, they didn't have electricity yet. In other words, electricity had already been invented, but it wasn't in the town. So in 1887, the city put in an electrical system so that there could be street lights and so people could have lights in their homes and businesses and offices as well. Now with street lights, you mean lights to give light onto the streets as opposed to a red, yellow, or green stoplight. Oh yeah, light. right. Not, not a stoplight, a traffic light, but lights to light up the streets, exactly. Uh, the first telephones were installed in the late 1880s. Fire departments in those days were volunteers. A lot of the young men really liked being part of the fire department, so they volunteered to do that on their, in their spare time. So they would have other jobs or work right. on farms, but if there was or a there fire, were they could come and help. They would rush and help whenever the fire alarm sounded. Um, another thing they put in in 1888 were sanitary sewers so that people wouldn't have to take all the, the kitchen slop out of their kitchen sink and throw it out the back door into the backyard or feed it to the pigs or whatever they did with it. They could actually have indoor plumbing then and have the, the waste from their kitchen or their bathrooms or whatever go out into the sewers. That must have been very nice in the winter time in the middle of the night to not have to leave your house to go to the outhouse. That's exactly right. And Before that, everybody had to go out into the backyard and use the outhouse, like you said, even if it was bitter cold and snowing out, which wouldn't have been very much no. fun. So the city had, uh, or the town of Fort Collins, did have various things that needed to go in to turn it into a city. But some other things also took place in the 1880s that started to turn Fort Collins into a city. For example, uh, a lot of the earlier wooden buildings started to be rebuilt using brick, which made them much more substantial, so they would last longer, and so they'd be less prone to catching on fire. That was an important thing to keep the town in place for the mm -hmm. future. Uh, people started building churches and new schools started going in. And um, the city hall was built in a firehouse. As you had mentioned, the need for, for the fire department to have a place to store its fire hoses and carts. Um, the opera house was built in 1881 and actually the opera house, which is still there in downtown Fort Collins, at least the building is still there. Right. Uh, was never really used for operas. What they used to have there, there was other so sorts of entertainment, such as singers and magicians and traveling shows that would come through town, um, acrobats and lectures and things like that. So the opera house was like a theater where there exactly. was a stage and seats for an audience. I've also read that sometimes it was the people of Fort Collins themselves that got up on stage. That's right. They would get up and have a talent show or give their own lectures and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so those were types of things that happened in the 1880s. Now one of the most important ones that I mentioned earlier was the waterworks plant which was put in in 1882 way out on the west side of town closer to the mountains. 
that waterworks plant was really important because before that, there was no way for people to get water piped into their houses and for water to be really available in case a fire broke out. How did people get their water then before the water? Works? What they did was that there were water wagons that would travel through town and people had to buy their water from the water wagons, from a company that would bring in water. Were they collecting it from the river or from Primarily rain? from the river. And what they would do was that they would sell you water. So for 25 cents, you could buy a whole drum of water, or for a nickel, you could buy a pail of water. Okay. So people had to buy water. So the waterworks plant was put in because of the need to bring water into the city and into people's homes and into businesses and to also make it available for the fire department to use for firefighting. So the plant supplied a really reliable source of water to the town. That's, that's a really important thing for a city that you may not need in a little village or town, right. even though it would be nice. So that was an important thing that took place, and that waterworks plant is still out there on Overland Trail. So you can still actually see the and original waterworks. You can actually water see it, and sometimes building. I think it's even open for people to I visit. Think a couple during times the a year, yeah. So that's uh, what took place then with the waterworks plant. Now, in, in the 1880s and 1890s, there were some other developments that took place in the Fort Collins area that changed things and changed the economy, the way people made money in a, in a big way. For example, sheep ranching became a big business around the city. There, we don't see many sheep being ranched here today, being raised today, mm -hmm. but at the time, there were a lot of sheep that were being raised in the area. And it was actually not so much the adult sheep, but baby sheep, or what we call lambs, mm -hmm. that the farmers were fattening up, or what they call finishing, lamb finishing, right, fattening them up um, for a year, and of course at the end of that year, you can enjoy lamb chops. Right, and you could also have the wool to use for making clothing or mm -hmm. other goods. Another thing that became a big business around Fort Collins was stone quarrying. In other words, taking stone out of the ground and using it for different purposes. Was there a specific type of stone they were digging or sure. mining? Mostly sandstone, and the, the process of removing it is known as quarrying, okay? And that was done up in the hills, the foothills above Fort Collins, where Bellevue is today, mm -hmm. and where Horsetooth Reservoir is, and also Masonville. And those areas had a number of quarrying operations going on that employed many men. And they actually had little, almost villages that were built up in those areas where people lived, where the kids could go to school. Mm -hmm. And for a number of years, they were taking that stone, and they were bringing the stone by train uh, into Fort Collins to be transferred to other places in the country, but a lot of it was used here in town as well. Mm -hmm. There are a number of buildings in Old Town that if you walk around today, you can see that they're covered on the outside or faced with stone that was quarried in the hills above Fort Collins. Right, like um, Avery's Bank, which is Bojo's Pizza today, right, right. or the Fort Collins Museum. Exactly, built in the park, that's right. Of sandstone from just west of our community. Right, and there are different colors. If you look at it right. carefully, you'll see there are different colors of that sandstone and they're all very pretty. Some of that sandstone was transferred by train all the way to places like Chicago and St. Louis and there are buildings in those towns that were made with sandstone from Fort Collins. From Fort Collins. The other thing that a lot of that stone was used for was for paving sidewalks. I know of some specifically in front of Nature's Own. Exactly, that's one I was thinking of oh, too. Oh great. <laughs> I always notice it there right in front of Nature's Own the store. If you look down on the, on the sidewalks there it's all stone that was quarried in the hills above Fort Collins. So that was a big business here. Another thing was milling. Now milling means that uh, a factory would be set up, mm -hmm. would be built, where farmers could come in and sell the grain that they were growing, the okay. wheat or other grains. And in that mill building there was machinery that actually the, the grain was put into and it would crush it and turn it into flour or process it for other uses. Okay. So milling became a big business here, and that meant that Fort Collins was the center of agriculture in the area. And the farmers would come in here not only to do their shopping, but also to bring their produce from the fields to be processed and to be sold and to be transported by train to other places in Colorado and throughout the country. Now, were there any other crops besides grains that the farmers Sure, grew? there was one big one that started up called sugar beets. Oh, that's where we get our sugar from, right? Exactly. Well, yeah, we do get some of our sugar anyway from <laughs> sugar beets. And uh, the farmers in the area in the 1890s started growing sugar beets. 
And sugar beets are just what they say. They're actually used to make sugar. There's really nothing much else you do with them other than produce sugar from them. Mm -hmm. Although the sugar tops could be fed to cattle, the leaves that grew oh. off the top. I think to lambs, too, to fatten them up. Is that right? To lambs, okay. <laughs> yeah. So that was used, uh, something that normally would be thrown away because they cut the leaves off the top, was used to feed the, the animals in the Beaters. area. Right. So it was the bottom part of the beet that had the sugar exactly. in it? Exactly, and that grew underground just like a carrot does. Oh. And they would have to pull it out of the ground, mm -hmm. cut the top off, and then that would be sent to a factory. All those thousands, thousands of beets, they were kind of big, and they would be processed in a factory. Now, Fort Collins got a sugar factory in 1903. There was one actually built here mm -hmm. uh, uh, in town, and part of that building is still standing. It's where right. the, the city streets department is, I think, That's today. That's right. And, um, that became a huge factory where all the farmers in the area, not all of them, but many of them, many of them. Who, the ones who were growing sugar beets, took their beets during the harvest season and they were processed into sugar. And the sugar was bagged and it was shipped all over the country. Now who did all of this work? We know farmers were growing the beets, but who helped with moving them and getting the sugar out of them and sure. sending the sugar on to stores? Well, planting the beets and tending to them and watering them and harvesting them harvesting meaning pulling them out of the ground and getting them ready to ship to the factory. Um, and the factory work itself was all labor intensive, which mm -hmm. means that required the work of a lot of people. And very few machines to help them do their work? Certainly not in the field. They didn't have much in the way of machinery that mostly had to be pulled by hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people that first came to do a lot of that work were people's, people who were Germans from Russia. Well, how can you be German and be from Russia? Well, these were people who lived in Russia, but their, their ancestors were from Germany. Oh. They had moved to Russia many years earlier. So these were people who came from Russia, but they were actually, their families were originally from Germany. If that so makes they sense. started in Germany and, and lived in Russia. Right. But they left Russia, mm -hmm. came to Colorado, and began to work in right. the sugar beet In the sugar farms. fields, sugar beet fields, and in the sugar factories. So those now where did all of people these people did. live? Did they buy some of the, those lots to build houses or did they have their own neighborhoods? They actually had their own neighborhoods that were surrounding the sugar beet factory. Oh, so they lived right near where they worked. Right, within walking distance. And those neighborhoods are Buckingham and um, Andersonville and uh, Alta Vista. Alta Vista. And so those neighborhoods are still there in fact. And uh, the nature of those neighborhoods has changed somewhat over the years because the Germans from Russia, although they worked in the industry for a number of years, started to be replaced over time by workers from Mexico. Now some of that, I think, is because the Germans from Russia saved their money and were able to buy their own farms and live in their own homes. Right. And so the sugar industry needed more labor. More workers, people right. People to do the work. And so then they began recruiting people from Mexico. From Mexico. And that's pretty common in most industries, most businesses where they're processing things mm -hmm. like that or manufacturing, making things, is that the workforce changes over time. And it usually changes in the way that the people who are the newest ones, newest immigrants, the newest ones to move into the United States, take over those jobs over time. And so the Mexican workers were the most recent ones to work in the sugar factory and the sugar fields, and they settled in those neighborhoods mm -hmm. near the factory and that their descendants are the ones who are still living in those neighborhoods today. I think they changed the street names in the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood of Andersonville to use Hispanic family names um, to show that Hispanics had been living there for uh, many generations. Many years, yes, mm -hmm. right. So that was a big business in Fort Collins for many years, many, many years. Again, that plant was started in 1903 and it finally closed in 1957. So for many years, that was an important business in Fort So Collins. for over 50 years, people were growing sugar beets right. and sending them to our factory. And making sugar, sugar right here in Fort Collins. Um, so another thing that happened in 1906, just a few years later, was that there were streetcar lines. Um, so a streetcar, is that different from a car that we have today? It sure is. In fact, if you go down Mountain Avenue, I think on Saturdays, during the summertime, you'll see a streetcar rumbling slowly down Mountain Avenue between City Park and downtown. Those streetcars were electric powered and they ran on tracks just like a train does. Mm -hmm. And people could get on them anywhere in the city. They ran all over the city on, on tracks in the street. 
and people could get on and ride from one place in the city to another. So almost like um, an early version of a bus. Exactly, that's exactly right, except they were on tracks and mm -hmm. were kind of like a single railroad car. Okay. Uh, instead of like a whole long line of railroad cars in a train. So you would pay a five mm -hmm. cents to ride on the trolley? Right, and, the, and the, there was actually a trolley car conductor who ran the car mm -hmm. and they would take you on different routes throughout town. What were some of the places you could go on the trolley? Well, some of the more interesting places that the trolley actually went was that it did go out to the sugar plant oh. so that people could travel from the sugar plant in and out of town. Mm -hmm. The other thing was Lindenmeyer Lake, which was an interesting place that was north of town. It was a lake there that's still there today. Mm -hmm. And it was actually a recreation center that a lot of the young people liked to go to oh, at the time. So they could go swimming in the lake? They could go swimming and boating. They also had uh, like an entertainment center out there and so it, it's understood that they had things like bears and monkeys out there that people could like see. Like a zoo? Like a little zoo of some oh sort. My. They had a recreation hall and they also had what we call Nickelodeons, which were little machines that you could put a nickel into and you look into it and you could see a little movie playing in it. Oh, there. how fun. So that was a big fun thing, a big deal for kids to do back mm -hmm. then was to go out to Lindenmeyer Lake on the streetcar and enjoy a day out there swimming and having fun. So that was... Um, uh, those were some of the big developments that took place uh, in that whole period from 1880 to 1920. One of the other things that happened, though, remember I mentioned the really wide streets mm -hmm. and how the women didn't like that they were getting their dresses real muddy? Right. Well, in 1916, finally, the city got around to paving the streets. Did they really? It took them a long time to do that. <laughs> but I'm sure that everybody, the women and the men and the children, were probably finally very glad very to get happy. rid of those muddy streets. Was it College Avenue that they paved first? Exactly. They, they paved College and then they started paving a lot of the other streets in town. That was a big undertaking to pave a street. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of men and a lot of equipment to do that. And it took Fort Collins a while, but in 1916 they finally got that done. So the paving of the streets must have really helped uh, automobiles uh, travel. But when did automobiles even come to Fort Collins? Well, automobiles were first invented in the 1890s, and they started showing up as kind of a novelty item. In other words, it was something just people used for fun, oh, okay. not something they really had originally as a means of getting around because people were still using horses and horse carts and wagons mm -hmm. and even the trolley cars. Um, but they started showing up in Fort Collins around 1900, 1905, during that early period. And usually the first people who got them in any town, and it was the same in Fort Collins were the doctors, because the doctors had to go make house calls at people's houses. And they also had the money to be able to afford a car because they were a little expensive. Because right. it was kind of a toy at the time in a way. Now they didn't call them cars back then, did they? They were called horseless carriages. Oh. And in fact, because it was like a carriage with no horse with pulling no horse. It. And in fact, they started to replace the horse pretty quickly. Didn't happen for a number of years completely, but people started to realize hey, we can get around with this thing without having to take care of a horse and feed the horse and take care of its physical problems. Right, and give it water. Right, and so the, the, the horseless carriages started to seem like a pretty nice way to get around even though they were noisy and smelly and mm -hmm. kind of a strange thing to see. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it also changed Fort Collins forever because the horses started to disappear. Right. In other words, people stopped using their horses to go into town or to get around town and they started using cars and the trolley system right. as well. And didn't the cars also eventually cause people to stop using the trolley system and also trains for exactly. riding places? Because it was so convenient, it was so easy for people to just get in the car and drive someplace rather than getting on the train or the trolley cars that they stopped using those and eventually the trolley system was torn out, although you can mm -hmm. still see some tracks in a few places. Right. You like can, along Mountain Avenue, you can see the tracks. Right. And still ride. One of the old trolleys has been repaired right. or restored so that you can, on Saturdays, ride it on Mountain that's right. Avenue. Right. So that's basically how cars impacted the city and its growth after that. A lot of it was dependent upon parking places to park cars mm -hmm. and places to drive cars and having streets that could handle right. all those cars. But it, it allowed the town to get bigger because you could travel into town from farther away right. in a shorter amount of That's time. That's right, exactly. And that impacted the town already in the 1910s and 1920s. Mm -hmm. It happened very quickly. Right. 
And of course, we see some of the problems today with the amount of cars on our road and sure. the pollution that happens because of it. That's right. The city had changed tremendously. It had gone from being a little town out on the edge of the prairie here with the mountains in the distance to this pretty good sized city that was growing like crazy mm -hmm. because new people were moving in, the university was doing very well and a lot of students were coming to study here, the economy in the area was doing well, the farms were thriving, the sugar plant was operating, and so Fort Collins had a great future ahead for itself. That's great. Well, as we have just seen, Fort Collins in this episode went from a small town to a progressive town around the turn of the century. They got things like water, indoor plumbing, electricity. An example of that would be the Bernie streetcar that you see here. It was restored and still runs in Fort Collins. Perhaps you've ridden on it. It runs on electric cables above the car. On behalf of Ron, Shalor, and myself, Kurt Canaram, I want to thank you for watching Fort Collins Before.